the only thing that could possibly top the worship time. That prepared our hearts sufficiently, and now we will get into the Word. What a blessing it is to be here tonight. Uh, I also have a, uh, a special blessing uh, tonight. We, it's been a while since I've been able to give you any information on our construction update. Um, for those of you who uh, were here last Sunday, um, it was an awesome day of fellowship, uh, but it was a very crowded day. And, and we, have, uh, we love it, and we have been given a mission to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to bring people into relationship through our verse-by-verse -verse teaching and personal discipleship. And so we are doing our best to do that, uh, but our prayer has been for space, and we've been running out of space. Um, our priorities right now are space for children, uh, space for parking, and space for seats in that order. Uh, we actually have a children's ministry, our, 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 what we might call our junior high, we call it Faith Climbers. They're actually meeting outside on Sundays because we don't have the space. And so we've been praying, we've been uh, brainstorming, we've met with an engineer, a contractor, and a, um, uh, I cannot think of the third one. He was a very nice gentleman, though. He came, he had a lot of great <laughs> ideas. Uh, environmentalists, thank you, that's what it was. Um, we did this because, as you, if you remember, it's been a little while. When we put the offer on the building, it fell through. Um, many of you gave financially to that project, which was a blessing. And when it fell through, uh, we still needed to do something. Uh, it was at that time we met with an engineer who, who basically had shared with us the state of Florida. It had There were some changes to some rules, which would then allow us to use the rest of our property. Um, but the church is growing so rapidly that we have kind of had to dream a little bit bigger. Um, our original idea for building a church back there, we, we, we realized the time frame in doing that. Uh, and, and so if we were to go that route with the, with the dream that we had for the church that we were looking to build, we would basically outgrow it before we're in it. Um, and so we've had to up our idea as far as size of buildings. So we are now working with the engineer, trying to get a building. Um, and what we're, what we're shooting for is a thousand seat sanctuary. And, and the reason for that is this is 200 seats. And we fill it three times on Sunday. And, and if you do the simple math and the time it will take to build, we have to do that. But one of the challenges is been parking. Um, you have to have, per Charlotte County, one space for every three people. So we would need roughly 300 parking spaces. Uh, currently, we utilize about a third, a little over a third, maybe 40% of our property. The rest of it is wetland. Um, the environmentalist is going to help us mitigate the wetland. Um, but the great part is... Um, we have met with a realtor, and we have now entered into contract with several of the properties around us to expand our lot in order to have more space for parking. Uh, yes. So that is the long term. The engineer currently is working on putting together a master plan. Uh, as soon as I have that, I'm going to post it in the hallway so that you can sort of get a bird's eye view of the lot and what it will look like with the new church on it. Where it will be, we're also going to put in a new entrance out the back over here, which goes out to Fairway Drive South, which is a much nicer, easier road, much easier to find uh, for people who, who, who arrived here for the very first time. It's like, man, there's a church back here. Yes, there is. Uh, we're going to try and make that a little easier to find for people looking for the church. Um, but here's the really good news. We have uh, actually purchased the lots coming in. There was empty lots to the right. There's a house on the corner, and there's an empty lot next to it. We have already purchased, in fact, it went through last Friday, the lot right in front of the church here that we usually park in front of and the empty lot on the other side of the house. And what we're going to do is the contractor has already submitted for a permit to get in there and brush all that out so we can begin to use it immediately for parking. Um, so that's going to solve our immediate issues for parking. Uh, and then we have an offer on the house on the corner as well, the one where you drive in. It is a great family. We love the family there. They actually attend church here every Sunday. It's the Tomlinson family. We love them. Um, they have been looking to, to, to move someplace where their boys have a little more space to run. And so um, we are con currently kind of negotiating out. Uh, so pray for that uh, because they need a place uh, to, to live and we need a place for children's ministry, which is what we want the house for so that we can move our youth group out there, move our junior high into that building, and uh, continue to reach as many people as we possibly can. So um, all that, and there's something even better because we're more immediate. Uh, we've been working towards um, building um, a big lanai outdoor and closing our front patio area so that it's both covered in the summertime 
and also that we can make it kind of a, it won't be indoor, it'll just be a covered awning, uh, but it'll be much more pleasant to sit out there in the summer, and we want to make that to an overflow area. We want to put a TV on the front of the church so that as people come, if they want to hang out outside, um, but we are also going to serve food out there <laughs> after service, yes, because we are called Calorie Chapel for a reason. <laughs> we have earned that moniker. Jesus ate with his disciples a lot. We are going to do the same. Um, but the real blessing behind that is that we realize with the three services, it's becoming much more of a challenge for people to fellowship because as you come to church, it's really hard to leave. It's hard to get the next crew in. And exactly what I didn't want to happen is happening where the church is beginning to get a little bit spread out. There's not a lot of fellowship. We kind of get done. We move out. We move a new group in. And um, it, is, it is necessary because this is the space that we have to work with. So I, I thank you very much for working with us as we've done that. It has allowed us to reach a lot more people um, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people are growing as we're going verse by verse through the scriptures. Um, but we really want to have a place for fellowship. And in order for that to happen, we need parking. And also we need a food station. And we're working on all those things. Hopefully, these things should be put together within the next month to two months. We're just waiting for the permit to be issued to start building that. And then we're going to build a big deck out the front of the patio as well, going over the ditch so we have even more space to hang out outside. So if you're going on vacation next week, and then you come back a month from now, it's still the same church, but it's going to look very, very different, um, which will be a blessing. So we just, to, just so you know, there are changes coming. The plans are to build. Uh, everything is on the table, and we're moving as quickly as we can. So for those of you who gave to the project before, that is what the money is being used for right now. We're expanding the campus. We're expanding for children's ministry, and we're expanding for parking and doing these things as quickly as we can so that we can continue to reach people. Amen? Amen. And it just so happens we're in the book of Nehemiah, which is all about building the kingdom of God. And as we've been going through the book of Nehemiah, it has been such a blessing to go through together in seeing just how God has worked through all of these people. There was a job that was too big, too hard, and it sat for too long without anybody doing about it until Nehemiah got there. He was the man God chose to use to come there to build the wall around the city. And of course, we know what that wall represent, represented. It's safety and security. This is what Jesus Christ represents to us. So we are our salvation. We are safe and we are secure in Christ. And this is what these people needed. They need that safety and they needed that security. They needed separation, that barrier for those who wanted to come in and cause harm or to take them over. So Nehemiah comes. He builds the wall. He, he, he gets the people together in this massive project. We just see how God's hand was all over it. The, the, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, the, excuse, not Nebuchadnezzar, the Persian king, he was the one that gave the money to, 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 to make sure the project continued. He gave the articles for the temple that had been taken when the Babylonians originally came and, and took over Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and destroyed the city. And so the, he's back now. Ezra's already rebuilt the temple. The wall is built. And then in Nehemiah chapter 8, we saw that there was a revival that happened. They broke out the word of God. They built a stage. They started reading the word of God. And then they were convicted by the word of God. And, and things just, just kind of start taking off from there. It's like they were hearing things in the word of God, and they were doing it. I say they were reading it, and they were heeding it at the same time. And they, and they were crying, and they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, which hadn't been done in years. And then, you know, we just saw them repopulating Israel, and there's this national fervor of revival in love and dedication to God that's just swelling in the streets and swelling in the hearts of the people. It must have been a pretty joyous time. Do you remember the day you got saved? Amen. The day that you raised your hand, and, and you walked out of church that day. I remember what it was for me. I didn't have a born-on date. Okay, I, di I, I didn't. I, I went to church, and I started hearing the word being taught, and slowly and, but surely, it began to change me. And then, and then I remember getting baptized very clearly. I got baptized, and I remember that day very clearly. And just, you know, this process of sanctification of God working in my heart was so exciting, and it was so new. And I was learning things so much, and I was walking this newness of life. And, you know, there were changes going on around me. There were changes going on with my friends and in my relationships and with my family. They were noticing changes in me. But the real blessing was the joy that was in my heart of knowing that I was right with God. The joy of walking in this newness of life and the blessings that were coming along with that. God was doing so many things, but 
I'm going to tell you a little story about a guy first. He was falling on hard times. He had lost his job at the furniture factory that he worked at. This was quite a while ago. And his wife and him separated. He had no money. And he, he, he just sat out one day just to look for work. He didn't know what else to do. So he was going to go out and look for work. And so he began to walk the neighborhoods, and he got to a nicer part of the neighborhood, and, and, and he went up to the door, and he'd been knocking on doors and asking if there was any work that he could do to try and earn some money to make some food. And, and finally, he gets to this woman's house, and she had lived by herself, and she was French. And she had this cool accent when she said things. And, and he got up there and thought, surely she's going to be nice enough. And so he says, do you have any work at all? And she says, can you paint? And he says, yes, I can paint. In fact, if you give me a paint, I'll paint, I'll paint anything you want me to paint. So she went, and she got a brush, and she got a bucket, and she said, go out the back and paint the back porch, and then I will give you some food when you're done, and I'll also give you some money for painting it. He said, done. He takes the bucket. He takes the paintbrush. He goes to the back. 20 minutes later, comes out to the front. He says, ma'am, I'm already done. She said, that's impossible. You painted the whole porch in 20 minutes? He said, yes, ma'am, but you should know that is not a Porsche. It is a Volvo. trying to do the right thing and yet ending up with a wrong result. That ever happened to you? You ever tried to do the right thing? You ever had a relationship that meant a lot to you and you wanted to build that relationship and the more you try and then you, know, you, you do something and then it just kind of destroys the whole thing, right? You were trying to build a relationship, you were trying to do the right thing, but nevertheless, I got offended, the relationship's off. Perhaps you were trying to, you know, complete a job and you were trying to do it the right way just to get to the end and find out you're not doing the right thing at all. You know what that's called when we try and follow God's law? We're trying to follow it. We're trying to do the right thing, but then you find out you're, you're not meeting God's standard. That's called sin. That's called sin. That means you're missing the mark. You're not hitting, you're not doing that which God has called you to do. At least you're not doing it the way that he wants you to do it. Perhaps you were trying to, your heart was in the right place, but you still weren't meeting the mark. Think of it in archery terms, when you let an arrow fly and you're trying to hit a target and you know, you're trying really hard, but you miss the target anyway. That's what sin is. It's missing the mark. But there's another kind of sin out there that's called a transgression. And, and in a transgression, you know exactly what you should be doing, and yet you do the wrong thing anyway. Transgression is what invites the consequences of God. You see, this is what Israel had fought over and over and over again throughout their time. Read the book of Judges. Every couple of chapters starts over with, and then they worship false gods, right? And then God rescues them. He raises up somebody, and they just, they're in this cycle of sin to salvation. At least seven times it happens through the book of Judges. And then it goes through kings, and, you know, it gets to the end of kings, and, and God has given them so many chances, and he sent so many prophets, and they, they just... They, they, they've hardened their hearts until finally God brings in the Babylonians, takes them out. Ezra brings them back. Nehemiah brings back even more. He finishes the wall. They've had this revival now, so they've kind of just gotten saved. But, you know, sometimes even for us, we get saved and we have that experience, but then we start walking with God. And then over time, we kind of start making little compromises in life. We, we kind of start doing things that we already know that we shouldn't be doing. Perhaps they were things that we used to do before we ever got saved, and somehow we find ourselves in life once again doing them. This was a struggle for the Apostle Paul. He says, he cried out. He says, why do I find myself doing the things that I don't want to do, and I'm not doing the things that I do want to do? We're sinful nature, man. I know what happens to you because I know what happens to me. Why am I still struggling here? Why am I doing this? I knew it was wrong. Why did I do it? I'm like a child. I'm like when my daughter does something. I'm like, why did you do that? She's like, I don't know. You know, I feel like God is doing the same thing. Why are you doing that? I don't know. We find ourselves a long way away, and then we have to reorder our lives. That's the beautiful thing about Christ, is that no matter where you are, you can stop, you can repent, and you can receive that forgiveness and walk in the newness of life once again. It's called grace. He saved you once. And that made you <laughs> forgiven. It didn't make you sinless. And so as we get into chapter 13 tonight, after one of the longest introductions in Rock Calvary Chapel history, <laughs> I want you to consider this. Because we're going to find out the Israelites did the exact same thing. In fact, there are three main areas that they struggled in, that we struggle in, 
There are three main areas, and we're going to find, we're going to learn those tonight, and we're also going to learn what we need to do about it. We're going to learn what we need to do about it. So if your Bible's open, chapter 13, let's read verses 1 through 3 together. It says, On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. Because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. So if we kind of remember back in the last chapter here, um, they had a wall dedication ceremony. And in it, they had worship teams and, and things were going good. And, and, and so this, this revival, if you will, continued. We don't know if this was a... Uh, a day that they simply just chose to gather for like a, you know what we might call a church service where the, where the word is going to be read or perhaps it was a feast day maybe feast of tabernacles where it was mandatory that the word would be read whatever it was they're reading what they called the law which would have been the first five books of the bible genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy and so at some point in the reading they get through deuteronomy and they get to chapter 23 and they hear this part they find out no Moabite and no Ammonite is to have any part with the people of Israel. They're not to be there. Now, some people have used this as sort of a racial sort of discretion, like, well, you know, you know it's just a, a reason for some sort of bigotry against Moabite or Ammonite people, and they've even done the ancestry and made some weird connections. It's not, that's not at all what, what God says here, because in the Word, we're told why they're not supposed to be a part of Israel. It says, because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Now, you have to go back to Numbers chapter 22, and you've got to read chapters 22, 23, and 24. The Moses had, had brought them out of Egypt, right? It was only supposed to be a few-week trip across Egypt to get to the Promised Land, but they, but they refused to enter by faith. Remember, there were giants down there that were terrified. Only Caleb uh, and Joshua came back and said, let's do it. The rest of them, the rest of the 12, nope, let's not. We can't do it. They refuse to take it by faith, and so God says, okay, this generation is going to die out before the next generation. I will bring the new generation in there, but your consequence is you will not be able to go into the promised land. And so they wandered the desert for several, several, several more years. While they're out in the desert, it's time for them to start moseying back to Israel. And they're following that big pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire at night, and it leads them into this area known as Moab. Now, if you follow Israel on the map today and you were to look at the Dead Sea, on the east side of the Dead Sea, you run into Jordan. And that southern part of Jordan, that is considered Moab. When you get a little further north, you get into the area of Ammon. And in fact, there's a city there today called Ammon, Jordan. These are the descendants of that area. That area is still called Ammon. The, the, the borders that we have today, those are different borders. Those borders didn't really exist back then. And so the Israelites are going to pass through this area. Now we find out what happens. First, uh, one of the groups tries to fight them. He sends out an army, and it doesn't work. And then the next group, they say, well, we can't beat him, so let's hire a prophet to curse them. So they go to this guy, Balaam. And if you remember the story of Balaam, this is the story where the donkey turns around and talks to him because he keeps beating him. He won't go. There's a, you know, we, we come that story. Now, now the, the people that hired this prophet to, to, to go after them truly completely misunderstood, uh, much like today, the gifts of the Spirit, okay? They thought that a prophet held on his own authority to speak on God's behalf. Like this guy could just, we could just give you money and then you could just take this money and then you can go over there and you can curse these people by their God and be rid of them. That'll be the way to take care of them. It was their God that got them out of Egypt. Everybody knew that. It was their God that did a whole bunch of cool works in the desert. But if we can get their God to turn against them, let's just pay one of their prophets to do that. So Balaam comes. What they completely misunderstood is, is that prophecy is not something that you just choose to open up from a box and glitter on people. You can only speak on God's behalf. And every time he went down to curse them, God would stop him and say, you can only say what I tell you to say. And so he would get down there, and instead he would bless them. And then he'd go back to the people who were trying to pay him money. And they were like, what gives? You were supposed to curse them. He said, I can only say what he tells me to say. So they, he goes down. They do this a couple more times. Um, Balaam comes up with a, with a much more sinister plan after that, which was to send all of their beautiful young girls over there to cause the men to sin with them. Ultimately, that does invite some judgment upon them. But because of this deed... 
the scripture says in Deuteronomy chapter 3, even up to the 10th generation, these people are to have no part in Israel. You're not to care about them. You're not to talk to them. You're not to have them over for dinner. They're not going to hang out with you. They're not to come to church. They're not to be a part of you at all. Now, first, we need to understand something. First, we need to understand something. This wasn't like great, 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 great grandpa really messed up. And because of that, I can't be involved with Israel anymore. That's not what this is about. It's kind of what it sounds like, but that's not what it's about. In order for them to be a part of Israel, they would have had to renounce their, 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 their ties to either Ammon or Moab and become Israelite, which was a process they could do. In order for you to become a Christian, you had to repent of your sins and receive Jesus Christ. You became a Christian. Now you are a part of the Rock Calvary Chapel family, which is part of a much larger Christian family of church across the world. You become a Christian, right? But here, it says if they do not do that, they choose to stay Ammonite, they choose to stay a Moabite, do not have them over. Why? Because in their culture, they were anti-God, they should have nothing to do with God. This was a way of protecting the people of Israel from those who hate God and had nothing to do with them. Don't have them over. Don't fellowship with them. This is a way of protecting. And so what happens is, <laughs> this, is this is so interesting, it, 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 when, whenever I read this and I was thinking about the, 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 the people who hired the prophet... That's so, it's such a misunderstanding because look what happened. It says he was hired to give them a curse, but what happened? He blessed them. All right? This is, should be of great comfort to you. Why? Because Satan can do whatever he wants to do. It doesn't matter to you. What matters is, is what God allows to happen in your life. Right? Satan can try and curse you all he wants. If, if God doesn't allow it, he's not going to get past it. We had a few weeks ago, I don't I debated whether or not to share this, but I, I, I'm going to share it anyway. A few weeks ago, after, Chris, after church on a Sunday, I was leaving the church, and I happened to look down one of the streets, and I saw some people walking. I kind of drove right past them. And my very first thought was I thought they were Mormons. I thought they were Mormons evangelizing the neighborhood. And as soon as I saw that, I, 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 I mean, I paused for a second because I thought to myself, this is, this is, you're in Rock Calvary Chapel country, brother. Right? <laughs> You want, to, you want to evangelize your non-gospel, we're going to have a problem. We're going to talk. I'm going to, I'm going to go over it. I'm just going to chat with that. But I, I didn't. It was just like this passing thought that went through my mind. But then I knew they weren't Mormon. I knew they weren't Jehovah's Witness because they were dressed in all black. It was two ladies and a guy. And I just thought that, and I thought, well, that's weird. I thought maybe just the people are just walking somewhere. It was just a weird thought that I had. I didn't act on it. I didn't drive down there. I didn't say, hey, what are you doing here? It's nothing like that. I just, I saw it, and I kept driving, and I kind of filed it away. A couple hours later, I get a call from some people in the church who live in the neighborhood. They said, there are some really weird people walking the neighborhood today, and they're, they're chanting something, and they're throwing rose petals on the ground. They're witches. That's what they were. It was, it was they were around. They were doing their thing. And they said, Pastor, I think they came down to the church. And I thought to myself, who cares? It doesn't matter. You know why? They can spout off all the words that they want to spout off. This is Jesus Christ Church. You have no power here. I'm not going to go down and start, you know, throwing oil all over the driveway and rebuking everything. It doesn't matter. They're empty words, guys. They're empty words. They can try and curse all they want, but God will turn that right back around and be a blessing because everything is Father filtered. If God allows it, okay. So what did I do? Well, I prayed for the people who were coming down trying to cast a curse. And I thought, you know, Lord, make this an Apostle Paul moment. Turn them from Saul to Paul, you know. And then I drove around to see if I could do it, but they were gone already, so I didn't get the chance to, to chat with them. But uh, anyway, thought I would share that just because it comes up right here. I'm just like, this is, this is such an example. The enemy tries to cause problems for the people of God, and it ends up being a blessing. So, so this happens. Now we get into verse 4. The people heeded the, the word of God. They separated out all the people. Now verse 4. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a large room where, gener uh, where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests. 
But during all this, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, or, excuse me, Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king. And I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, and I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given to them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back into his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, Why is this house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and new wine and the oil into the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah the priest, and Zadok, the scribe, and the Levites, uh, Padiah, Padiah. And next to them was Hanan, the son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful. And their task was to distribute to the brethren. So after the reading of the word, sometime right around there, Nehemiah goes back to the king. Now, if you remember all the way back in chapter 1, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, second in command of all the kingdom. He was a close confidant. He tasted all the, the food and the wine before the king to make sure that there wasn't any poison or anything crazy in it. He was good-looking, we find out, in the, corner, in the court. He had to be good-looking. He had to be a, uh, in good shape in order to be in that position. And really, he had the king's ear, so he was a very powerful guy. Now, when God had called him and, and, and he put it on his heart, and then he went back to Israel, one of the questions the king had was, how long are you going to be gone? In other words, he was a very valued, probably even friend, but certainly employee, and he was very, very important to the goings-on of the government of this Persian king. And so the king says, how long are you going to be gone? Now, he gives him a period of time. He goes off, he builds the wall, and at some point after the revival... Nehemiah, he goes ahead and, and says, okay, you got the word, you're on fire. He gave the priest everything. Everything was, in, everything was all put together, taken care of. Now I can go back to the king. So, so we find out roughly, most Bible scholars put this, about 10 to 12 years. He's been gone for about 10 to 12 years now. When he gets back, he finds out Elisha, the high priest, made a room and was letting Tobiah, you remember Tobiah, Tobiah was the guy who gave them so much heartburn when they were trying to build the wall. This was the guy that threatened to come in and murder every man, woman, and child there. This was the guy who first tried to join them and wrote letters back to the king. He was working on behalf of Satan himself to discourage everything that was going on. He was anti-God. He opposed the things of God. Nehemiah goes away, and he comes back to find that guy living not in Israel, in the temple. And to make matters worse, he was an Ammonite. We find out in chapter 2. Remember that? Tobiah the Ammonite, the man's from Ammon. He living in the temple. To make matters worse, it was the storeroom where the tithes were kept. And that tithe was supposed to go to the Levites and the singers. In other words, the people on staff taking care of the temple of God were the ones that were supposed to be being paid. And since they weren't getting paid, they had to feed themselves and their families, so they went back to work. One man's sin, Eliashib, brought the enemy into what I'm going to call now the church because we're going, to, we're going to bump this up into modern day terms. In fact, we can go New Testament on this one. The apostle, we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians right now. The Apostle Paul planted the church. He gave them Jesus Christ. They saw power in the book of Acts. I mean, they saw great things in Corinth. I mean, God was doing amazing things in the church in Corinth. The church grew up. Paul goes on. And then one day, word gets back to him. I mean, these are like his children. And this is, he, is, he has got an emotional attachment to those. He considers himself their father in the faith. And truly, he was. And he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. This, this was a close bond. And what does he find out? He finds out that back there there's fighting. There's bickering. They're threatening to divide the church to, to, to the followers of, you know, first, first church of Paul, first church of, uh, you know, Jesus, first church. And there was all these divisions. They wanted to divide up. And there was, Paul had been teaching them about unity. And now they're going completely the opposite direction. 
He finds out some dude is shacking up with his mother-in-law, and they're in a relationship, and nobody in the church is doing anything about it. He finds out they're suing each other. Can, we, can you imagine getting that information for people that you love? Have I just described somebody's family? Or, or at least portions of it? I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not immune. I've got family dynamics like you do, too. People you love doing stuff like this. And so, you know, Paul finds this out, and he, he writes this letter of correction and rebuke to them because he loves them. And we find the same thing going on here in Nehemiah. But I want to bring this up, not from Old Testament to New Testament. I want to bring it up to, like, right now. Because I put myself in these shoes. How would I feel if I went away for some reason, for a period of time? Maybe I'm on an extended mission trip for a year. I don't know why I would do this. It's just a hypothetical. What if I were gone, and I came back to this church, and I find, uh, I don't know, I, I find a pimp doing business out of the back room of the church. I would be livid. I would be furious. I'd be heartbroken first, but I would be furious. I, I can't imagine Nehemiah coming back and being like, what are you doing? And this is Eliashib. This is the high priest. This is the spiritual leader. This is the guy making this decision. Why would he make that decision? That's the question I have. Why would he do that? Unfortunately, the scriptures don't give us insight, except for in verse 7, it says that I discovered the evil that Elisha did. Whatever he did, whatever was motivating him, it was evil. Now, we do come to one of our first ways of, the, uh, of, of temptations of places our lives get out of order, and that we know that there are really three temptations, but I believe this one falls under the pride of life, right? It's probably not too far. Now, I'm going to just, I'm going to, where, where I give my opinion, I say, this is my opinion, okay? This is, I'm just going to step out from the scriptures here, and I'm going to say, it's probably not too far of a stretch to say, this was probably had more to do with power, right? Elisha, the high priest, Tobiah was, we find out, of a, a very high up important guy. And, and why would he? And we find out at the end of the chapter that their families married in. So he formed it. It says he was allied with them. They formed some kind of an alliance. Now, the reason you would form an alliance is to have some sort of power. They still do that today. Kings, if they want to form an alliance with another country, they'll have their, you know, the, the, their prince and princess. They'll get together and they'll marry and they'll be tied together in marriage. And it's more of a power. It's like a political kind of thing. And we know that the, that the high priest, well, he's got a lot of power. He's got, you know, in politics, he's got a lot of a great influence over the people. So why would he do this, and why would he move Tobiah himself there? I, I happen to believe that it fell probably under the pride of life. He, he, he wanted power. He wanted that success. And so he compromised and probably even justified it, just like you and me do. Oh, Tobiah, he's not a bad guy. Man, it's been 10, that was 10 years ago. He's changed. You know, he wants to be in Israel now until Nehemiah shows up. Nehemiah goes in, what is that? And where's all the stuff that's supposed to be in there? Nobody says anything. <laughs> he goes in, I love what he does here. Look at what it says. It grieved me bitterly. Yeah, it grieved him. The high priest is making a choice like this. Not only that, but there's more priests and they didn't correct him either. It grieved him bitterly. <laughs> I love this part. Therefore, I threw all his junk out of that room immediately. That's a man I can get behind right there, isn't it? Yeah. He didn't call up Tobiah. Hey, Tobiah, listen, I need you to rent a truck and come and get your stuff next Thursday. Okay. No, no, no. Next Thursday. No, he didn't do that. He didn't talk to the priest and say, listen, you made the mistake. You need to call up Tobiah. You guys need to work this out. He can't stay here anymore. He didn't do any of that. He opened up the door, he started grabbing Tobiah's stuff, and out it went. Gone. Tobiah was probably a little bit upset, but Nehemiah was on to what he was doing. He dealt with it swiftly, he dealt with it immediately. And then look what he did in verse 9. Then I commanded them to cleanse the room. This is a ritual cleansing. They ritually cleansed the room. Then he said, bring back all the stuff that's supposed to be in here. This room is sanctified. It is set apart for the uses of God. Get this thing back in order. He's reordering things and putting them back to where they need to be. We're going to come back to a few of these things at the end when we see how it's dealt with. But for now, I just wanted to do that. And then what does he do? He puts people that he says are faithful in verse 13. They were faithful, considered faithful, and their task was to distribute. So he reemployed all the people who were supposed to be being paid. He paid them. The people began to bring their tithes. He reused the storehouse. Tobiah is gone. That is scene number one. 
Scene number two picks up in verse 15. But first, Nehemiah steps out here in verse 14, and he just kind of speaks to the Lord. He does this a couple of times. He says, Remember me, O God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of God and for its services. You think Nehemiah is feeling a little bit defeated? I mean, he's got to be feeling like, at this point, he's feeling a bit like a failure. He, he basically is praying to God, Lord, these people have blown it. I did my best. Please remember me. I mean, that's just a, that's, that's a synopsis of his prayer. Verse 15, he gets into this again. It says, in those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. Oh, goodness gracious. And bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them out of the Sabbath, or sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this you do on the Sabbath? There's that word again. By which you profane the Sabbath day. Did not your fathers do thus, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and in this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut, and I charged that they must not be opened till after the Sabbath. Then I posted some of my servants at the gates, so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. Then I warned them and said to them, Why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay my hands on you. For, the time on, uh, for that time on the Sabbath, they came no more. <laughs> and I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O God, concerning this also. And spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. Nehemiah has got to be, I mean, to find Tobiah in the temple would have been extremely disheartening, frustrating, upsetting. But as he hangs out a little while longer, 10 to 12 years is all that's gone by. And he starts noticing the people doing work on the Sabbath day. Now, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath, as Jesus points out. The Sabbath was made for man for a couple of reasons. One, to take a day off. God knew that we would justify working all seven days a week. By our own greed and desire to be productive, we will work ourselves to death at the expense of relationships. At the expense of the relationships with our family, with our friend, and the biggest of all, God. And so God said, the seventh day, keep it holy, you shall do no work. You'd think that would be understood. And yet the people of Israel, leading all the way up to the Babylonian uh, takeover, completely rejected the Sabbath day. They were buying, they were selling, and that was in fact one of the ways God determined the 70 years against them. They refused every seventh year was supposed to be a Sabbath year to let the land rest. They didn't do it. So God says, you've been here 490 years. For every year you didn't let the land rest, it's going to rest now. So 70 years, that's what you're going to be spending in Babylon. Now they've come back. They haven't been back for very long. Nehemiah, they've had this big revival, and Nehemiah gets back, and he's dealt with Tobiah, and now he's looking around, and he sees all the people doing what? Buying and selling once again on the Sabbath day. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Then, <laughs> I love this. He says he goes and he contends with them. And he orders that the gates will be shut. But the people from Tyre, you see, they're not Israeli. They're not, they don't follow Jehovah. They don't follow God. They, they follow, they got their own gods. They're from someplace else. All they care about is doing business. And so even though the people aren't doing business, they hang out at the gate hoping to entice somebody out to do business. Nehemiah comes out, and this is biblical. You do that again. Now, this doesn't mean I'm just going to send some police officers down to arrest you, and we're going to hold you overnight just to teach you a lesson. This was, you do that again, you're getting a beat down. <laughs> Sanctified Bible talk right there. <laughs> and he means it. What does he do once again? He not only commands it to be cleansed, 
He commands the Levites to go down, stand by the gate, and make sure this doesn't happen again. So he sets a firm boundary for the nation of Israel. The priests and the Levites, they purified themselves. They purified their people, and they are sitting there now at the gates. So they've already messed up with Tobiah. They've already bought and sold on the Sabbath day. What else could go wrong? Verse 23. In those days, I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. So I contended with them. Listen to this. This is more sanctified Nehemiah action. I contended with them. I cursed them. I punched some of them in the face and pulled out their hair. And swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. <laughs> if you go back to Ezra chapter 10, Ezra has already dealt with this subject. The men, in, the men they had intermarried with the people around them, and God had specifically told them not to do this thing. Deuteronomy, once again, chapter 7, verse 3. They probably had read it already. Do not marry outside. And the reason given? Because they're going to entice you and ultimately you're going to end up following their gods. And this is the major sin that Israel fell under that continually caused them to worship false gods over and over and over again. Go back to the book of Judges over and over and over again. Why did Nehemiah react in such a harsh? Why was he throwing punches and pulling people's hair out? The strictest... And the harshest consequences come down on the transgressions. These people knew what they were doing. They had already been warned. And listen, what's the big deal here, right? So their children are bilingual. What's the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. They're one generation away from completely forsaking God and being right back where they were right before the Babylonian conquer. That's the problem. The children, if they don't speak Hebrew, they can't read Hebrew, they can't read the scriptures, they can't follow the scriptures, they don't even know who God is, they're completely out of it. Why should you not intermarry with a non-believer? As Paul says, do not be unequally yoked to a non-believer. Why is that such a big deal? Because it's a lot easier to take somebody and, get and prevent them from going to church than it is to get somebody to go to church. It's easier to pull somebody down off of a chair than it is to lift them up onto a chair. It's always easier to get somebody to give into their fleshly nature and follow and fall away than it is to get somebody to overcome their fleshly nature and be a follower of Jesus Christ. This is why you don't be unequally yoked with non-believers. And it is such, it's such a terrible thing to counsel somebody and to watch people make this choice and later on fall away from the church and disregard it completely. It is such an awful thing. It's such a hard thing to see people completely disregard God's word and go into a marriage and you just, you just know. You just know. It didn't have a chance from the start. It's, it's awful. And this is what he is, he is taking such a hard line. And then he goes on in verse 26. He says, Did not Solomon, the king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among nations there was no king like him, who was beloved of his God and made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, what was Solomon's weakness? Pagan women caused even him to sin. The wisest man in the Bible. <laughs> wisdom comes through God. He had God's wisdom. This man could answer any biblical question there was. This man knew the Bible better than anybody else in the history of Bible knowledge. This man knew what not to do. And yet, because he gave into the lust of his flesh and he married pagan women, you read the book, you get, to, you get through uh, the book of Kings, you get through all these things, and you just see how the sin just permeates over and over and over again. So he says in verse 27, Should we then hear of you doing this great evil? Ooh, there's that word again. That's three times. He says, transgressing against our God and marrying pagan women. And one of the sons of Joida, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat. So you see now, we see the connection. Sanballat was allied with Tobiah. These were the two guys that were constantly causing the problems for Israel, threatening to kill them. 
Eliashib's son-in-law intermarried in. This was part of the intermarriage. And he himself was serving as a priest, though he had married outside of, and he brought, you know, he was allied with somebody God told him not even be involved with. And so he says here, and one of the sons of Jehovah, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, verse 28, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore, I drove him from me. Remember them, oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. Thus, I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits in the appointed times. Remember me, oh my God, for good. He constantly cycles back to this. Question, isn't this a weird way to end? This is the last chapter in the book of Nehemiah. And, and for all intents and purposes, this is basically the end of the Old Testament. As we get into the prophets and then the minor prophets and, and, and the books of poetry, these all took place before. For the most part, this is pretty much the end of the, of the narrative of the Old Testament. From here, it was about 430-ish uh, B.C. Jesus is going to come in a couple of hundred years. We also find out that, that, that during that time, the word, the word of God was very rare. Um, it didn't, didn't, wasn't... Wasn't, there was a long silence from God as these people were living. The book of Daniel tells us all of these uh, nations that are going to rise up. And, you know, he was talking about, you know, bears and, 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 you know, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, all the way through, you know, the history and talking about the, the, the prophecies that were to come. And so, but for the most part, this is kind of the cliffhanger that we end off of. Until Jesus Christ, this is what we have to go off of. Why was chapter thir 13 included? Wouldn't it have been cooler to end it at the end of chapter 12? And include that little section about them reading and separating away from the Ammonites and the Moabites and be like, yes, stop there. Nehemiah, why don't you just go ahead and leave the rest of the page blank? We don't need to know how, me how messed up these people got after only 10 to 12 years, but, but we do. We do, surprise, because this is us. This is you and me, and this, this, is, this, is, this is where we are. You see, we got saved, we gave our life to Jesus Christ, and, and we raised our hand, and for a while we grew, and it was so exciting, and then as life went on, life happens. Family happens. Issues in the marriage arise. Church becomes routine. Things happen, and then suddenly we begin to make tiny compromises in our life. And then tiny compromises lead to bigger compromises. And pretty soon, you're standing way over here where the trail you wanted to be on is way over here. And you're asking yourself, how did I get here? The same three ways that these people got all out of order, it was the pride of life. Eliashib, he wanted success, and so he allied himself with somebody, and he made a bunch of sacrifices, and it began to affect everybody around him. He fell into the pride of life. Then, then you have the, the Sabbath. What was that all about? That was greed, the lust of the eyes. Greed drove them to disregard God's word, forsake for all intents and purposes. I'm going to put this into a modern day uh, text for you and me. Basically, they start skipping church and they start going to work. And the excuse is, well, I got to provide for my family. And I would say, what happened to the rest of the six days a week? There's six days in which you do work. The seventh is dedicated to the Lord. Why don't you dedicate it to the Lord? I mean, it, seriously, it can get much worse than that if you want me to drive this nail a little bit further. You know, he hung on the cross for you. Can't give him an hour on a Sunday? My goodness. <laughs> and by the way, I'm talking to me too. I've skipped church for ridiculous things. I, I remember when the, on the West Coast, the Seahawks played at either 10 a.m. or 1 o'clock, which was a quandary for me because... Our services were only at 9 o'clock and 11, and if they played at 10 a.m., what am I going to do, right? I'm either going to get there late, right? Well, actually, I get there late either way. Solution, I'll stay home today, and maybe I'll just catch a message later. Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. If that's your mindset, you're fooling yourself. Listening to a message doesn't replace church. There's no fellowship in listening to a message. You may get the word, you may get that, but you don't get any of the benefits of being at church. And it's important, this is why the church exists. And if you want to go the route of where two or more are gathered together, yeah, that was talking about church discipline. So we can talk about that too. <laughs> church is important. 
What were they doing? Lust of the eyes. It was greed. They had justified it for sure, but they were doing work on the Sabbath. Lust of the eyes. And then, of course, the last part, they begin intermarry. Why would they do that? Probably because they were hanging out in places they shouldn't be hanging out in. They were hanging out with people they shouldn't be hanging out with, and they were looking at girls they shouldn't be looking at. And they begin to compromise and compromise and compromise until they found themselves one flesh unequally yoked with a non-believer. And it's horrible because now they're going to raise a family this way and the children were probably not going to be raised up in the ways of the Lord now. And they were one generation from causing this. You see how these sins have an effect on everything else? Now here's the good news and here's the hope because I feel like I've really pushed you in the pool here. Let me help you out. Here's the hope. There's something you can do about it. Because if you're convicted by anything here tonight, and you find yourself in any one of these places, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, and you have made small compromises, and you find yourself compromising, and it's getting bigger, and that picture in your mind is now flashing a red light on you, and you know you need to do something, Nehemiah came back, and what did he do? He did a couple of things. Number one, he dealt with the sin immediately dealt with the sin immediately. He did not wait. He did not talk about it. He didn't ask his friends to pray about it. He didn't talk to other people and tell them how horrible the sin is. You know what he went? He went in. He threw the stuff out. He went to the elders and said, shut those gates. No more. He went to the people who were sinning and started throwing haymakers at people. So I don't, I don't say go that far, maybe on yourself, but he dealt with the sin immediately. Does this have a New Testament correlation? It does. Matthew chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus Christ himself says this. If your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. And, and you know what he says after that? He says it is better to enter the kingdom of heaven without that arm than it is to go to hell with that arm. And he uses another illustration. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Get rid of it. Because it is also better to go to heaven without that right eye than it is to go to hell with both eyes. Right? Jesus is saying, don't wait. Don't make your excuses. Don't talk about it. Deal with it right now. In Ephesians 4.22, Paul reminds them to put off the old conduct. Put off their old ways, lying, cheating. He goes on and he does this list. He says, put them off. It has the indication of taking off dirty clothes. Get rid of it. Burn it. Put it behind you. Deal with it now. Number two, repent of the sin and receive forgiveness. You see, it's not enough to just simply stop the sin and put it away, but you notice what he had to do? He had to cleanse the room. He cleansed it. How do you cleanse your guilty soul? Well, you take it right back to the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. This is the thing. Whenever we hide from God, whenever we don't want to talk to him about stuff, it's because we don't want to face it. We don't want to talk to God about that. It's the shame that builds up. And we don't want to take our shame to God. But I want to share with you a secret that's going to help you break the ice in talking to God. He already knows. He's waiting for you to acknowledge it to him. He already knows. I've had these talks with my dad as a young man. The worst words a young boy ever hears from his mother is, wait till your father gets home. And then dad gets home, and you hear the voices, but you can't pick out the words because you're in your room trying to figure out how you're going to somehow absorb the blow. And dad comes in and says, what happened? Usually I would start off with a laundry list of excuses and start blaming or shifting or doing all these you know, little maneuvers that never work because your dad already knows what happened. Your heavenly father already knows what happens. The thing about it is, is he's not an angry God that's sitting there just waiting to slam you when you mess up. That's not it. He's a heartbroken God about the sin for sure, but he does want to give you that grace. He wants you to, he wants you to, he wants you to get it off your chest. He wants you to let it have, he wants you to let him have it. He wants you to give it to him, confess your sins. That's called repenting. That's part of the repenting. Repenting is actually turning from your sin and turning to God. This is the cleansing process. And then in God's grace, which governs all of his dealings with you, and all of that in the blood of Jesus Christ, he forgives you of that sin and the guilt and the shame no more. Those who have been set free are free indeed. No need to forgive yourself. You don't have the authority to do that. Only God has the authority to forgive you, and he's already forgiven you, so you can put it away. This is the cleansing part. So not only do you deal with it immediately, but you repent and you receive that forgiveness. I love what they said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. 
He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and receive the Holy Spirit. This was his solution after he had convicted them with their own sin. After the, the, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. He gave them this long history of Israel and how many times they messed up. He says, the good news is you can repent of your sin and you can be filled with the Spirit. And, oh, that feels so good to do. That feels so good to do. After you repent and you receive forgiveness, set things in order. Set things in order. When he got Tobiah's stuff out, he cleansed the room and he put the stuff back in that was supposed to be there in the first place. When he shut the gate, he put the Levites there and made sure that they weren't going to, you know, that the business wasn't going to be a transaction anymore. When he talked to the people, well, he kind of became their accountability. But you've got to set things back in order. And why, why do I even bring that up? Well, I'll tell you why. Because when you're walking in sin, you're, you're not really walking with God either. Right? And, and what I mean by that doesn't mean you're not Christian anymore. What I mean by that is that when you're walking in known transgression and you know you're sinning, you're probably not reading your Bible. And, and you're probably not spending much time in prayer either. And, and you're probably beginning to become less frequent at church. You start withdrawing. I see it all the time. People start walking in sin and you just you slowly start drifting away. You stop doing the things that you know are going to bring you life. So once you've repented of these things, you have to go back to the first fruits. Go back to your devotions, putting your life back in order, setting the old habits that used to be there and restarting these things again. Continue to do your devotions in the morning. Continue in your prayer life. Be at church. It's a huge deal. Iron sharpens iron. It's a big deal to be around one another. Fellowship is a huge deal. Koinonia, the fellowship time, being around other believers, it is all part of God's church. It is a big deal. If you start skipping that, well, things don't normally go well. So you deal with your sin immediately, you repent, you receive the forgiveness, you set things back in order, and here's a really important thing to do. You set up boundaries with accountability. Boundaries with accountability. After Nehemiah threw all of Tobiah's stuff out, cleansed it, and he put back the stuff, it says that he staffed it with faithful men. He put faithful men back in there. Why? So that he, that he makes sure not only are they receiving the right count, but that they're distributing the right amount of money to the people who need to get it because they've not been paid in a long time. So he put faithful men there. What happened when it was the gates? He put Levites there. There was faithful men making sure there wouldn't be a done. These were boundaries. The gate was the boundary, but he put the men there for accountability. And then same thing with the people. He made them promise, you will not give your daughters away and don't take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. He said, well, and in that case, Nehemiah was their accountability. They didn't want to get a beat down again, so they weren't going to do that to him. But here's the point. Back in chapter 10, if you remember, remember during the height of their fervor? They signed a contract, and they promised not to do three things. They said they won't neglect the temple of God anymore, they'll keep the Sabbath, and they won't intermarry with the tribes around them. Ten years later, they found themselves doing exactly that. Without, you know, signing the contract, that's, that's wonderful. That's good. Promising God you'll never do it again, ah, I'm, I'm glad your heart is in the right place. Set proper boundaries and have somebody in your life that can bring that accountability, that can ask you the questions, that can hold you accountable to what you say. If it's an issue with internet stuff, have that accountability. Set the boundary, have the accountability. If it's an issue with alcohol, set the boundary and have accountability with somebody. It's such a huge deal to walk in newness of life. This way you don't keep falling into the same pit over and over and over again. But once again, I want to return back to the hope because I want to close here. The hope is that you will be right back to where you started, that joy of the Lord. When, 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 when David in Psalm chapter 51 pours his heart out to the Lord, he says, Lord, don't take your spirit from me, please. Create in me a new heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. It's that right spirit. It's that right place. The, look, church, there's no better place in the world to be. When your spirit is right with God, when you can worship him with your voice and your prayer and your life, and you don't have the guilt and the shame treading behind you everywhere you go, and you feel that closeness, and you can enjoy it, my goodness gracious, I can't describe it in my own life. All I can tell you is walk in it. Amen? Right. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and this time. And Lord, this message that you have for us, and what a, what a cliffhanger to end on, Lord, finding out that this is where the nation is. But Lord, we know that 400 years later, you sent your son 
You sent your son, Jesus, Lord. This, 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 this grand act of love to the world. And here we are now, Lord, on this side of the cross, looking back, Father, and just knowing that it is your love. For, God, for you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Father, we've given our lives to you, Lord. It's that everlasting life that we're looking for, but also, Lord, the joy. Create in us, Lord, a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within us, Lord, as we deal with our sin, as we bring it to you, Lord, and we lay it back down at your cross. Father, I pray for your cleansing. Cleanse us with hyssop, Lord, through the blood of your son, Jesus. Forgive us of all of our sins, Lord. Rise up in us again, Lord. Give us your mercy, your joy, ah, and most of all, Lord, your grace. We pray these things, Jesus, and also I pray that you'll keep us safe on the way home. And you'll bring us back together again on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Great night. See you at the weekend.